Okay, welcome back to week six, American Literature 4. And this week we're going to be uh, introducing our new uh, geographic area called uh, New Netherlands. We're going to take a look at uh, two videos uh, today. Uh, Simon and Garfunkel's uh, The Boxer, uh, Billy Joel's uh, New York State of Mind. And then we're going to take uh, some time and set the background for our three readings for next week. The uh, first author is uh, O. Henry. And then we're going to look at the work of uh, Nicoletta Moore and uh, Piri Thomas. And at this time, we'll uh, continue on with a couple more chapters of uh, The Abundance of Catherine's. Okay, New Netherland is a highly commercial culture. New Netherland is materialistic with a profound tolerance for ethnic and religious diversity and an unflinching commitment to the freedom of inquiry and conscience. According to Colin Woodward of our 11 different countries within America. It is a natural ally with Yankeedom and encompasses New York City and northern New Jersey. The area was settled by the Dutch in 1621. The inhabitants of New Netherland were European colonists, American Indians, and Africans imported as slave laborers. The colony had an estimated population of about 8,000 at the time of transfer to England in 1674, half of whom were not Dutch descent. Initially a fur trading post, started the Dutch West India Company, which required land to be purchased from the Indians. The Dutch West India Company introduced slavery in 1625 with the importation of 11 black slaves who worked as farmers, fur traders, and builders. They had a few basic rights and families were usually kept intact. They were admitted to the Dutch Reformed Church and married by its ministers and their children could be baptized. Slaves could testify in court, sign legal documents, and bring civil action against whites. Some were permitted to work after hours, earning wages equal to those paid to white workers. When the colony fell to England, the company freed the slaves, establishing early a nucleus of free African Americans. The concept of tolerance was the mainstay of the province's Dutch mother country. The Dutch Republic was a haven for many religious and intellectual refugees fleeing oppression, as well as home to the world's major ports in the newly developed global economy. Concepts of religious freedom and free trade, including a stock market, were Netherlands imports. The Dutch continued to be uh, the Dutch language continued to be spoken in the region for some time. President Martin Van Buren grew up in New York, speaking only Dutch, becoming the only president not to have spoken English as a first language. Today in New York City, there are as many as 800 languages spoken here, making it the most linguistically diverse city in the world. New York City is multicultural, 
36% of the city's population is foreign born, one of the highest among US cities. The 11 nations uh, with the largest sources of modern immigration to New York City are from uh, the Dominican Republic, China, Jamaica, Guyana from Africa, Mexico, Ecuador, Brazil, Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago, Colombia, Russia, and El Salvador. These enclaves of ethnic neighborhoods uh, give the newly arrived uh, immigrant a chance to meet and uh, work within a um, self-enclosed environment uh, of their previous language and culture. It's a good and comfortable starting point for them, but the negative factor is, is that many just stay within that enclave neighborhood, never really learning English. Uh, the second generation uh, the kids of those immigrants today seem to do much better. Okay, so our first song is by uh, Simon and Garfunkel, entitled The Boxer. Paul Simon was born in uh, Newark, New Jersey, to Hungarian Jewish parents. Musician Donald Fagan described Simon's childhood as that of a certain kind of New York Jewish background, almost a stereotype, to whom music and baseball were very important. I think it has a lot to do with the parents. The parents are either immigrants or first generation Americans who felt like outsiders, and assimilation was the key thought. They gravitated to black music and baseball, looking for an alternative culture. After graduating from high school, Simon majored in English at Queens College and graduated. Paul Simon has won 12 Grammy Awards, one of them a Lifetime Achievement Award. Art Garfunkel was born in Queens, New York City. His father was a traveling salesman. Garfunkel is of Romanian Jewish descent. Garfunkel's love of singing originated in the first grade. He met future singing partner Paul Simon in the sixth grade when they were in a school play together. Garfunkel ultimately earned a BA in art history. And then he went on to get his master's degree in mathematics education from Teachers College, Columbia University. He completed coursework for a doctorate. Garfunkel has undertaken several long walks in his lifetime, writing poetry along the way. He has walked across Japan, he has walked across the United States, and he has walked across Europe from Ireland to Istanbul and Turkey. The song The Boxer was originally written with a verse that is not present in the album. And that uh, verse is as follows. Now the years are rolling by me. They are rocking evenly. I am older than I once was and younger than I'll be. That's not unusual. No, it isn't strange. After changes upon changes, we are more or less the same. After changes, we are more or less the same. 
The song lyrics are taken the form of first-person lament as Singh describes his struggles to overcome loneliness and poverty in New York City. The narrator is particularly scarred by the experiences that he had as a young man who left his home and family and went was no longer that boy. Doing so under some vague pretense that life on his own would be better than wherever he came from. The narrator has had to endure loneliness, poverty, homesickness, and urban isolation. His overwhelming desire to overcome his isolation has led him to make some unsavory choices. The narrator clearly is very desperate for some sort of connection with the human race. Okay, uh, the next song is sung by uh, Billy Joel and written by Billy Joel, and it's called New York State of Mind. His uh, real name is William Martin Joel, and he was born in 1949 in the Bronx, uh, New York, and grew up on Long Island, both places that influenced his music. He started taking piano lessons at age four. His father was born in Germany and left to escape World War II. He was a businessman. His mother is from Brooklyn, New York, and Joel attended Hicksville High School until 1967, but he did not graduate with his class. In fact, he graduated 25 years later. Joel's parents were both born into Jewish families, but he was not raised Jewish. He attended a Roman Catholic church with his friends. He now identifies as atheist. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, the song, uh, New York State of Mind. New York City has a charm all its own. Legendary singer-songwriter Billy Joel had been living in Los Angeles for a few years back in the early 70s, but he felt the East Coast city gently tugging at his heart. Once he moved back home, he was inspired to write a dedication amidst the city's own turmoils with crime and drugs. Joel says, a lot of bad things were happening in New York then. There was a lot of crime, drugs were out of control. The city looked bad. It was really dirty. I wanted to write an anthem for it. Joel was literally taking a Greyhound bus on his way back to Highland Falls, which lies roughly 90 minutes north of New York City where he began jotting down the song's initial bare bones. It was one I wrote in like 15 minutes, he said. It was the day I moved back from California to New York. I'm sitting on the bus. I started scribbling in a notebook. I got to the house where my wife was waiting. I said, I got to write this song right now. Of course, over the decades, the song has taken on various meanings. Following the, following the 911 terrorist attacks, the ballad became an anthem of patriotism. When we did the song at the telephone immediately after 911, the concert for New York City, everybody was just about in tears trying to get through the song. He said in the same. Newsday story. Like a eulogy, it was difficult to get through. He had it 
I just kept staring at the fireman's helmet on the piano. And I just kept thinking, just look at the helmet. Just look at the helmet. Don't think about what you're feeling right now. Think about the guy who wore that helmet and do the song. So that's a quick story about uh, Billy Joel's uh, New York State of Mind. Okay, so what does it mean to be a New Yorker? New York, a city full of dazzling lights, incredible food, and the most self-assured people in the world. Either adored or completely loathed, New York is a place where there is no middle ground. You either are or aren't from here. You either do or don't like it here. On a blog, this uh, lady uh, writes about her life in New York City. And it really sums it up pretty nicely. Her name is uh, Velvet uh, Braham. Uh, she lives in New York City, and this was written a couple of years ago. She's talking about uh, Billy Joel's uh, song. She says, I love that song. For me, it's about rolling out of bed on a Sunday morning, walking one or two blocks to pick up a bagel and coffee for breakfast and the giant weekend edition of the New York Times. You fall back into bed and read it cover to cover and do the crossword in pen. Well, you tell people you finished it in pen. Bonus points if your corner bodega has a cat to keep the mice away. Hell, you probably have a cat for the same reason. It's about people, so many people, living in close quarters. You hear our neighbors walk on our ceiling. Our neighbors hear us walk on theirs. On hot summer nights, we are all out on our fire escapes. It's about a city of people of all colors and all religions and all levels of wealth and poverty. So many languages are spoken in New York. You couldn't keep track if you tried. Instead, you learn to say hello, good morning, how are you, in maybe a dozen languages and coast by on that, except for your corner bodega. You know exactly how to order your coffee there in Spanish or Korean or Mandarin. You know which places are closed on the Sabbath. It's about finding the one place you like to go to for a cold beer and a quick meal, where you know the staff and they know you. And then everybody else finds the place and it becomes too busy and or the rents rise until they close and you have to find a new secret favorite place. Repeat. It's about hard working, being scrupulous about finances, being predatory about finding the perfect apartment with the perfect supervisor. It's about wandering the museums for hours on a whim. The temple of then Dor, Monet's The Water Lilies, Dali's The Persistence of Memory. There's a Picasso goat statue on the roof of the OMA that I love. The dinosaurs in the Museum of Natural History. The Rose Center for Earth and Space. Central Park Theaters. More theater shows than you could possibly watch before they close. Comedy clubs, jazz bars, the Philharmonic Orchestra. Hop on the subway and ask people to get somewhere. Everybody has an opinion on which line to take and where to transfer, depending on the day and the time. Ask the same people where to get the best pizza and get ready for an amazing debate 
and they're all correct. It's about being surrounded and smothered by other people and also feeling solidarity and lonely. It's being able to walk around at any hour of the day or night because the city truly never sleeps. You can choose to connect with any people that you like, or you can weep openly and others will leave you. It's rooftop gardens. It's street markets for farm produce. It's knowing the dogs at the dog run better than you know their owners. It's constantly evolving. It's challenging. It's alive. It's irritating. It's thrilling. It's so beautiful and it's so ugly. You either love it and you will never leave or you hate it and you can't wait to get out. It's under your skin like a tattoo. I landed here in 1991. I kept thinking the feeling would wear off, but it hasn't yet. Well, I don't buy the New York Times in print anymore. The rest still applies. Sometimes when I leave for a chunk of time, I look forward to getting away from New York City. And my family lives in Indiana, South Carolina, and Florida. But so far, every time, despite the fact that my relatives are hundreds of miles away, returning to New York City feels like coming home. Anyway, that's what I think when I hear the song. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, authors that we're going to be reading about uh, next week. And our first author goes by the pen name of O. Henry. He's famous for his short stories. His tales romanticize the commonplace. In particular, the life of ordinary people in New York City. His stories often had surprise endings, a device that became identified with his name. He was born in 1862 in Greensboro, North Carolina, and he dies in New York City. And his, again, his real name was uh, William Sidney Porter. Henry's rich canon of work reflected his wide range of experiences and is distinctive for its witticism, clever wordplay, and unexpected twist endings. Like many other writers, O'Henry's early career aspirations were focused and he wandered across different activities and professions before he finally found his calling as a short story writer. He started working in his uncle's drugstore in 1879, and he became a licensed pharmacist by the age of 19. Her first creative expressions came while working in the pharmacy, where he would sketch the townspeople that frequented the store. The customers reacted warmly to his drawings and he was admired for his artistry and drawing skills. Henry moves to Texas in March of 1882, hoping to get rid of a persistent cough that he had developed. While there, he took up residence on a sheep ranch, learned sheep herding, cooking, babysitting, and bits of Spanish and German from the many migrant farmhands. He had an active social life in Austin and was a fine musician, skilled with the guitar and mandolin. Over the next several years, Porter, as he was still known, took on a number of different jobs, from pharmacy to drafting, journalism, and banking. Here's where the twists and turns really started. Banking in particular was not to be O'Henry's calling. He was quite careless with his bookkeeping, 
fired by the bank and charged with embezzlement in 1894. His father-in-law posted bail for him, but he fled the day of the trial in 1896, first to New Orleans and then to Honduras, Honduras in Central America, where there was no extradition treaty. He befriended a notorious bank robber there, Al Jennings, who later wrote a book about their friendship. Well, Henry sent his wife and daughter back to Texas, after which he stayed in a hotel to write his first collection of short stories published in 1904. He learned his wife was dying of tuberculosis and could not join him in Honduras. So he returned to Austin, turned himself into the court. His father-in-law again posted his bail so that he could remain with his wife until her death in 1897. He was sentenced and served in federal prison in Ohio for five years from 1889 to 1902. During his jail time, he returned to practicing pharmacy and had a room in a hotel and never had to live in a jail cell. O'Henry was always a lover of classic literature. And while pursuing his many ventures, O'Henry had begun writing as a hobby. When he lost his banking post, he moved to Houston and 1895 and started writing for the post, earning $25 a month. An average salary at this time in American history was probably about $300 a year. O'Henry collected ideas for his column by loitering in hotel lobbies and observing and talking to people there. He relied on this technique to gain creative inspiration throughout his writing career, which is a fun fact to keep in mind while reading his stories. The many twists and turns of his own life, including his travels in Latin America and time spent in prison, clearly inspired his stories, twists, and wordplay. Oh, Henry's prolific writing period began in 1902 in New York City, where he wrote 380 short stories. He wrote one story a week for the New York World Sunday Magazine for over a year. Okay, so I'd like to talk about one of O. Henry's uh, more famous stories. It's called The Last Leaf. And the story was written in 1906. And it's about two young women who are artists, uh, Sue and Jonesy. And they live together in a subsection of New York City called Greenwich Village. Now, uh, Greenwich Village has been and, and still is kind of a hangout place for artists, musicians, poets, philosophers, intellectuals, um, like-minded uh, people of that ilk. And uh, there has been a magazine that's been published there since 1955. It's called The Village Voice. It's kind of the avant-garde uh, newspaper magazine of what's going on in the creative world. So um, they live there. And uh, at that time, uh, pneumonia, uh, respiratory illness, was going around and making a lot of people very sick. And uh, one of the girls, uh, Johnsy, uh, gets pneumonia, and she's uh, sick in bed. And her, her bed is situated such that she can uh, look out her window and uh, see the backyard. And it, in the backyard is a uh, brick wall. And on the wall is uh, growing this vine called uh, ivy. It's a, kind of a green leafy plant. And it's 
fall and the uh, leaves are starting to uh, turn color and uh, drop off. So uh, she believes that when all the leaves are gone, that she will die. So one by one, the leaves are falling. Her uh, housemate is uh, very concerned. The doctor says that uh, she needs to have some inner strength, or will to survive, to overcome the sickness. One of the neighbors, an older man, also an artist, also an alcoholic, uh, he goes out at night on a cold, rainy evening, and he paints a leaf on the brick wall. So when Jonesy looks out the window. She sees that leaf and a few other leaves that are there. Still thinking, oh, when all the leaves are gone, I'm going to die. All the other leaves, of course, fade away, get blown off, except for that one leaf that appears to her to be a real leaf. But we, in the story, understand it to be a leaf that's been painted on the wall. She uh, decides to have uh, second thoughts as the leaf continuously stays there. Uh, she decides that she has been selfish and uh, morose, waiting for her own death, and decides to suck it up and get better which she does. And the leaf uh, could hold on for so long, so could she. She uh, gets better and survives. But the artist that painted the leaf, Mr. Burham, he gets sick from going out and painting the leaf on that cold early winter night and he dies. So the leaf is a symbol of uh, despair that turns into a symbol of hope. And uh, John Z uh, thinks the ivy leaf stands for her life, slowly falling away. When the leaf remains, however, it becomes a symbol of hope for her. If the ivy leaf can hang on, so can she. So this is kind of a, a good uh, analogy of the style of uh, O'Henry's stories, lots of little twists in the plot and, and that sort of thing. And this is one of his more uh, famous stories called The Last Leaf. So our next story that we're going to read is called uh, Shoes for Hector. And it's uh, written by uh, Nicolasa Moore. And um, she was uh, born in uh, New York City in uh, 1938. And uh, she is what's called a New Yorican uh, writer. Um, these are people that are born in the United States, but have uh, Puerto Rican uh, heritage. Uh, Spanish is their first language. And um, in 1973, uh, she becomes the first Latina woman in the 20th century to have her literary works published by a major commercial publishing house. And she's had the longest uh, creative writing career of any Latin female, female writer uh, from these uh, publishing houses. Uh, her works tell of growing up in the uh, Puerto Rican communities of the Bronx and El Barrio. And a, El Barrio in Spanish just means a neighborhood. 
and of the difficulties uh, Puerto Rican face in the United States. The, these uh, uh, New Eurecan uh, refers to members of a culture of the Puerto Rican dysphoria uh, located in and around uh, New York City. There's a, almost two million uh, New Eurecans uh, living in New York today. And it's the uh, largest uh, Puerto Rican community outside of Puerto Rico. So this is called the in-group and the out-group. So people from Puerto Rico proper, from the island of Puerto Rico, don't consider the people that have migrated and grown up in New York to be of the same culture as the island-born Puerto Ricans. And this even goes on today. So we have a group of the same people that subdivide due to some cultural difference, what have you. So uh, she is part of this uh, New Yorican uh, group. Uh, they have uh, their own literary circle. Uh, they created a, uh, a poetry uh, club uh, just for uh, Puerto Ricans living and growing up in New York City. Now, these uh, barrios are kind of tough places to live. So lots of gangs, and crime, and violence, and drugs, alcoholism, and um, single parent families, poverty, uh, many don't complete school. It's a never ending cycle. Again, we talked about these uh, immigrant groups kind of being a, a, a nice, easy place to land when you first come to America. On the positive side. Here again, on the negative side, they have their own troubles that that it creates. So um, she writes a lot about uh, feeling like an outcast is a common theme uh, in her stories. And it uh, parallels her own life experience. Our next author is uh, Harry uh, Thomas. Again, he is uh, part of this uh, New York uh, group. Uh, he was uh, born to a uh, Puerto Rican mother and a Cuban father. Uh, his uh, childhood neighborhood is uh, in an area of New York City called Spanish Harlem. Very much riddled with uh, crime and uh, violence. Uh, according to Thomas, children were expected to be gang members at an early age, and he was no exception. Uh, he was exposed to racial discrimination from many points of view because of his Afro-Latino heritage. He identifies as black because of his Afro-Puerto Rican heritage. So. He's uh, not really 100% black. He's not 100% Puerto Rican. So he gets discrimination from all different points of view. Um, Thomas became involved in uh, gang warfare, uh, drugs, uh, and crime. He uh, spent seven years in prison. Uh, he reflected on the teaching of his mother and father and realized that a person is not born a criminal. Consequently, uh, due to his uh, gang experience and his time in jail, he uh, gets out of jail and he uh, decides to use his uh, street and prison 
know-how to reach at-risk youth and to help them avoid a life of crime. He uh, was, uh, he's traveled all around the world uh, giving lectures at uh, universities and colleges on the subject of uh, at-risk youth. Um, he passed away in uh, 2011. His uh, story of uh, Amigo Brothers um, is a story about two friends. Uh, amigo means friend in Spanish. Living, living in the uh, Lower East Side of New York. Um, many boys from the Lower East Side have dreamed of building a better life by winning the New York Golden Gloves Boxing Tournament. So back in the 40s, up until about the 90s, uh, on, in every neighborhood there was uh, some kind of a boxing um, arena, a training area. Uh, police got involved uh, as kind of a um, early uh, crime prevention or trying to keep kids out of gangs. And the Golden Gloves is a serious uh, boxing tournament for amateur uh, boxers. And you would see these uh, all over New York. Of course, uh, today they've turned into uh, yoga studios or platelet uh, gyms or Zumba or that kind of uh, exercise place. So those, those old world uh, boxing uh, places are, are, are long gone. So in his story, the uh, Amigo Brothers, it, it talks really about uh, friendship and uh, two boys that are competing in this uh, Golden Glove uh, tournament that uh, have to uh, fight each other uh, to gain the title for that year. And of course, uh, there's always a, uh, a twist to the plot and a surprise uh, ending. So um, these are the authors that we're going to be reading in uh, next week's lesson. Okay, so let's uh, take a little time and do a couple more chapters of our book, The Abundance of uh, Catherine's. Now, where we left off, Colin has uh, done a very stupid thing of uh, calling his uh, ex-girlfriend, um, Catherine Keen, and uh, she uh, basically uh, blows him off and uh, doesn't really want to talk to him, uh, definitely doesn't want to get back together, and says uh, they made the right decision uh, to stay apart. Colin's all busted up about this. He goes uh, back to the house, crying. Uh, he goes to his room. He's going to work on his theorem. He works on it for several hours. He's not getting anywhere very frustrating. He does what most geniuses do when things don't go their way. They want to burn their notes, give it up, throw it away. So he searches the room for matches, can't find any. Goes ask Hassan if he's got matches, of course he doesn't. Knocks on Lindsay's uh, door. Um, she says, yeah, I've got matches, but what do you want to do? And Colin tells her that he wants to burn his notes, that it's, the theorem isn't working out, and he's done with it. She says, oh, well, uh, let me take a look at it. So they sit down together, and they kind of go through the notes, and she understands a good bit of it. And... Uh, she says, uh, well, look, um, 
let me hold on to your notes for a couple of days. And if you still want to burn your notebook uh, in a few days, we'll go burn it together. Okay, fair enough. Juan goes back to his room, sleeps. They, uh, the next uh, day, uh, Hassan uh, decides that uh, he doesn't want to go to work. And uh, he just sleeps in for the day. So um, Colin and uh, Lindsay uh, go off together to uh, do an interview. I think it's like a Friday night, possibly. So um, at the end of the uh, interview day, um, they come back home and Lindsay and Hussan uh, want to go hang out with TOC and the boys. Just kind of have a small town uh, friend gathering, uh, which they do, but uh, Colin wants to uh, stay home and read. And he reads a book about uh, Thomas uh, Edison, and he finishes that book, and he finds a book on the bookshelf in his room called Foxfire. A Foxfire is a true uh, book series about uh, survival in uh, Appalachia, in the mountains. People live in log cabins, make their own furniture, eat wild game, that sort of thing. And again, he has a, a great memory uh, to recall everything that he reads. And this is going to uh, Come, become important a little later in our story. So, nevertheless, um, Hassan and uh, Lindsay return. And uh, Hassan uh, tells him that uh, he uh, had a great time. And uh, he met a girl, uh, the other girl in their group, Katrina. And uh, they seem to be kind of hitting it off a little bit. And uh, he even drank a beer, which is, uh, like I said, he, he practices Islam, but doesn't always follow the rules. And uh, so he said he had a good time hanging out with them. It was kind of a little adventure. Okay, so it's the weekend. Um, Hassan decides to go out again over the weekend. Uh, he actually gets uh, kissed by the girl, uh, Katrina, um, comes back and uh, tells Colin all about his romantic interlude. Colin just doesn't seem to be impressed by this at all. The sound's kind of angry with him. The sound has always been there. Uh, for a call and through his ups and downs through his romantic life. And yet when Hassan has a little uh, romantic story to share, Colin seems disinterested. So uh, this kind of weighs on their friendship a little bit. They don't talk for several hours, but Hassan finally explains to him, Hey, you know, I've been at your side all this time and when, when it happens to me, you, you don't seem to, to care. And Colin reflects on that, and he's kind of sensitive. And he realizes that he should have been a, a better friend in, in that situation. So um, during the last couple of times out uh, that Hassan has been hanging around with the local TOC and and um, Katrina and the other two boys, uh, coming up in a few days, uh, they decided that they would go on a uh, hunting trip together. And they invited Hassan and uh, Colin to uh, come along. Now, both Hassan and uh, Colin have no experience in the woods, 
Not even camping. No idea how to shoot a gun. No idea what's involved in hunting. But, nevertheless, they feel as though they should go along. So, some time passes, they do some more interviews. Lindsay is getting some clue about what's going on. Uh, Hollis is going to be selling some property. Uh, she is curious why her mother's going to be selling some land. She uh, wonders why she's selling the land to a developer. Something that she said her mother would ever do, and yet she is. So something's going on, and Lindsay wants to find out. But she can't do it, obviously. She kind of has to sneak around and figure out what's going on on her own. She can't just come up to Hollis and say, hey, why are you selling that property? Okay, so there's a few days before the uh, hunting trip. And Lindsay uh, goes out and uh, finds a shotgun to teach uh, Colin how to uh, shoot a rifle. She doesn't want Colin to embarrass her uh, on the hunting trip. So um, they leave together, leave the house together, and go out to that uh, property that uh, Lindsay's mother, Hollis, is uh, going to sell. And it's a big, big stretch of wooded uh, property. And um, she takes the shotgun out and fires it off a few times and instructs uh, Colin into how to hold a gun, and how to squeeze the trigger properly, and how to aim it, and she warns him that the gun is really uh, powerful. And uh, when you shoot it, uh, the gun will recoil. It uh, kicks back. Uh, and she kind of, you know, warns uh, Colin about this, but, uh, you know, he doesn't really pay attention. So she loads up the gun uh, for Colin to practice his first shot. And he shoots the rifle and he falls down on his back because the gun is so powerful. Of course, not listening to what Lindsay had said earlier. So um, he practices some more and they shoot up all the forest and all the ammunition and yeah, he, can, he knows how to shoot a gun now. Okay, so the day of the hunting trip uh, comes. Uh, Colin and uh, Hassan had uh, discussed uh, the hunting trip uh, before, and uh, they both agreed uh, that uh, they would not uh, kill anything. Uh, they would just kind of pretend uh, to be hunting. Okay, so hunting day comes, they get up real early in the morning before the sun, even before the rooster crows that usually wakes up Colin every morning. They're up and out of the house. They're going to a, uh, a camp, a little hunting lodge, a little cabin. And uh, TOC, the two boys, and, uh, and the girl, uh, Katrina, are there. And there's an older gentleman there. And uh, come to find out that uh, this is TOC's uh, father, who is uh, an expert uh, pig hunter. And um, they decide to go off in um, different groups. So um, Colin and Hassan are assigned to uh, TOC's uh, father. Uh, again, he's a guide, and he wants to make sure that 
to city boys uh, don't get into any trouble. So they uh, start off their hunting expedition. It's kind of a nice little walk through the woods. And what they're looking for is uh, these dug up mounds of fresh dirt that the wild pig uh, digs up looking for roots to eat. So he, um, he takes them through the woods and they start to find these, uh, actually it's Colin that discovers it, uh, finds these uh, dug up piles of dirt. He says, well, where there's one, there's more. And once we find more, we know the trail. And they search around and search around and they, they find more. So they find the trail. And now uh, TOC's dad is, isn't walking. He's actually running through the woods because he's tracking this wild pig that they're hunting. And he's uh, going quite fast. And uh, the two boys are out of breath, exhausted in a short period of time. They kind of wimp out. They uh, tell uh, TOC's dad, hey, look, you know, we just can't make it. We're out of breath, we're exhausted. We're gonna sit here, we're gonna rest. And he says, well, okay, I really wanna go get this pig. So if you guys are gonna quit, that's fine. Stay here and I'll come back for you. Okay, fair enough. So they uh, find a, a log, they sit down and they're kind of talking and of course, Collins doing his usual reminiscing and going from one thought to another. And they had some sandwiches that were made up and they eat up all the sandwiches and drink the water that they have. And it's been quite a while now since uh, Yossi's dad left. And um, all of a sudden they kind of hear a strange noise uh, in the brush um, a little far away from them, but, you know, not too close. And uh, they stop talking and they become very quiet. And um, suddenly they see a uh, wild pig uh, in the brush and it's walking toward them. Now, they did keep their rifles. Um, the Pig is, spots them, sees them. And these wild pigs uh, have these huge teeth that grow up into like a tusk outside their mouth. And when they attack another animal, they use those as a, uh, for defense and kind of stick it into the animal with their, with their head. So all I had read a little bit about this in the Oxfire books that he was reading up in his room a few days before. And he knows that the uh, wild pig is going to charge them, charge after them. So he stands up with the rifle. Uh, the or really notices them now and starts to charge toward them. He fires the rifle at the pig. Totally misses. But the pig is becomes afraid of the sound of the gunshot and turns around and runs away. Okay, good. They're safe. They scared the, uh, the pig away. Everything's good. Colin looks at the tree that he just shot. And he notices that something's coming out of the tree. Doesn't know what. There is movement in the bullet hole. It just went into the tree. All of a sudden, he realizes 
He didn't shoot a tree. He shot, he shot a bee's nest. Not the cute little honeybees that go from flower to flower that you see in your garden. These are wasps. Wasps are about twice the size of a regular bee. And uh, if a honeybee stings you, which would be really unusual, it can sting you once and then it dies. And uh, the poison that's in the honeybee is uh, just a little, just enough to irritate. But the poison in the wasp is uh, abundant and they can sting many, many, many times. And so it's, they see the wasp coming toward them in a swarm, a whole group of them. So now they are totally panicked. They're running through the woods just to get away from the, from the wasp. They each get stung multiple times. Finally, they ran far enough away that the wasps return back to their nest and they've totally lost their way. They don't know where they are. They're lost in the woods in Tennessee. So they have a little bit of adventure for the next couple of hours, trying to find their way back. They come to a roadway roadway that looks familiar to Colin. It's not the roadway that uh, the camp was on. It was a familiar road. And that road was the road to the uh, gravesite of the Archduke that they had been on their first day. So they're kind of walking up the road. And I think I'm going to leave off at this point. Uh, this becomes the real climax of the story. And um, I don't want to spoil it for you. Uh, this is where things become very interesting for Colin on. Okay, so uh, that's it for today. Uh, take a look at those uh, readings that we uh, introduced earlier, and uh, we'll talk again next week. Okay, thanks. Goodbye.